It is 12 o'clock noon here in Fort Atkinson, so I would like to begin this webinar. I want to thank all of you out there for listening and joining us today. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Dairyman Magazine. And we would welcome you to our monthly webinar series, which is co-hosted by Horde Dairyman and the University of Illinois. Today, our webinar is titled Calcium and the Transition Cow. And our presenter is Dr. Gary Etzel, a professor and veterinarian from the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. We are very pleased to have him with us as he shares his knowledge in the area of fresh cows and hypocalcemia. This month's webinar is sponsored by TechMIP. We thank them for their support of this program and allowing us to help, allowing us to make these educational programs available to all of you. If you are listening to the presentation live, you can have access to a PDF of the presentation slides, um, and you can find that on the GoToWebinar control panel down at the handout section. There you can click on, click on the link, and then you can print out the note pages if you want to jot down some notes or save those for a later date. Our webinar team consists of Jim Baltz at the University of Illinois and our Horde Steriman Online Media Manager, Patty Herchin, and they do all the behind the scenes work to help make these monthly webinars run smoothly. My co-host is the wonderful Mike Cutchins, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois. And at this time, Mike, I'll have you further introduce Dr. Etzel and kickstart this month's webinar. Well, very good, Abby. Thank you very much. It is my professional and personal honor to introduce Dr. Gary Etzel. And by the way, he's a good friend as well. He earned his uh, BS degree and DVM degree at The Ohio State University and then earned a master's degree here at the University of Illinois. He also practiced in, uh, in Reedsville, Wisconsin, and was uh, for a period of time in the faculty at Colorado State University, joining the University of Wisconsin staff in 1989. And he is professor of uh, food animal production uh, section uh, Department of Medical Sciences School of Veterinary Medicine. Wow, that's a long title there. Uh, Gary also is very active in AABP, American Association of Bovine Practitioners, and just about every year pr provides a some type of training program, either in the area of transition cow or dairy cattle nutrition. And he's an, a speaker on that program as well, and he's received many prestigious awards. Dr. Etzel, we are very excited to have you here back for another webinar here at Horse Dairyman. We'll turn the program over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for the kind words. So we are going to talk here today about calcium and that transition cow. I'll try to keep this as practical as I can for you and try not to go back too much for things that I might have covered in the previous webinar, which I believe is 2014. So this is our title, and we're going to jump right in. Let's start with some nomenclature. There are a few different terms around this. I want to be clear what we're going to be using here today. Clinical milk fever, I'm going to talk about as this group over here. These are cows that are recumbent or will soon be as a stage one clinical milk fever cows on their way to going down. The name is obviously inaccurate. These cows are not febrile, but it's been around a long time. Parturian paresis, paresis puperalis, parturian apoplexy or other old timey names for this one. And I would remind you though, there are a number of non-parturian cases of clinical milk fever that happen outside of the calving window. The other term I'm going to use extensively here is subclinical hypocalcemia or SCH. It, it's special. It gets an acronym. These signs on this are minimal and they are non-progressive clinical signs. That's the point. Most older cows develop subclinical hypocalcemia, and I'll show you those numbers. It's most harmful if it persists out past about 48 hours post-calving. And when we see it, it may be secondary to another condition and not a primary hypocalcemia per se. So okay, we have our first polling question. That's going that's going to come up, Dr. Etzel, and here we go. You get a chance to vote uh, very quickly, vote early and vote often. Um, my biggest concern regarding hypocalcemia is A, or one, clinical milk fever, or B, subclinical milk fever. So the polls are now opening, and we are off and running here, and we are getting very close to 50% of the vote here. It looks like the Democrats and the Republicans are voting today. That's always a good sign there. Abby, which one are you going to vote? Uh, I think I would vote subclinical just because I think that would be the, the harder one to identify and come up with protocols for. 
Okay, very good. Uh, Jim, we've got 75% of the vote in. Let's close it. We'll post it. And Dr. Etzel, what do you think of the results? Well, that's what we would expect. And we still do have clinical cases, and I want to cover those and make sure that we are not forgetting those, but also the subclinical is certainly where the action is. So off we go. I'm going to divide this presentation up into five, if you will, lessons and just things we've learned recently that I think may be helpful or perspectives we have. I'm going to start with this number one. Calcium homeostasis is fragile around calving time. It's a difficult time metabolically for the cow. And why does that happen? It's because milk is really, really high in calcium. And it's great for our product. So we're going to go right to Babcock Hall, our dairy plant here on campus, going to get a pint of milk. I'm going to look at the label on that pint of milk, and it says for people, 30% of your calcium daily requirement is met by one serving. There's two servings in that pint. Of course, I drank it all. I got 60% of my human daily allowance of calcium right there. That is amazing. And cows are pumping all this calcium into their milk to support the skeletal growth of their calf but they put themselves at great risk to, re to secrete that much calcium. They are amazing in the amount of calcium they pump out. We do not want to take this one for granted. So let's think about the cow. Is she cab? Colostrum is even higher in calcium than milk, about twice as much. So we go from 0.5 grams of calcium per pound of milk up to 0.8 or one. This is a real shock to the cow's system. Yeah, she's been developing the fetal skeleton. That takes a little bit. But suddenly in that day before calving, especially 12 hours before calving, she starts making that colostrum. She could easily put 15 grams of calcium into that first colostrum. That'd be assuming 15 pounds of colostrum yield for older cows, at one gram per pound. But then the real kicker is she repeats that 12 hours later. And then we just keep milking this cow. So we're 20 to 30 grams of calcium outflow that came out of nowhere in the first 24 hours. And then it just gets worse after that. They keep pumping out more and more calcium. As we move up toward peak milk, I looked 120 pounds of milk is 66 grams of calcium outflow. And that really is putting a strain on this cow. We're at four times maintenance on her calcium, that's about the same as her energy. And we think of cows being these marvelous energy athletes, but they're also calcium athletes as well. So cows are gonna struggle with calcium balance post-calving, just like they struggle with negative energy balance post-calving. You look at the study from 2009, where they checked calcium balance on cows, which is a pretty big effort. And they started at week two after calving, hit them at five, eight, 11, and 20. So we're going to look at their calcium balance over here. We've marked the zero point where the calcium inflow equals the outflow. And we're going to see how long these cows are in negative calcium balance. That's going to depend a little on their diet. So they had three diets with three levels of calcium. This is a lower calcium than we would normally put in our fresh cow diets, but they were negative at week two negative at week eight, really negative at week 11, which is interesting. Let's go with a more normal calcium level. This is a 0.78. They started at week two in negative um, calcium balance, got up a little bit higher, dropped again at week 11, and we're in good shape by week 20. And then a higher calcium in that lactating diet, a 1% would be by week two in positive calcium balance. They were probably negative before that. But oh my, they dropped at week 11 also. So what happened out here? What went wrong? Well, nothing went wrong. They just ran the off-sync program. And most of these cows were around estrus, and estrus decreases appetite. Estrogen hormone impairs bone mobilization of calcium. And now you see the fragility of calcium balance in early lactation cows. So how do they do it? And two simple words. No, they're not simple. Lactational osteoporosis. Now, they don't get pathologic fractures, which is amazing that they don't. They draw the calcium from their bone. In fact, they're going to lose 9 to 13% of their skeletal calcium in the first 
30 days in milk, that's about two and a half pounds of elemental calcium lost from maybe 21-ish pounds of elemental calcium in the bone. So when you see this skeleton of a cow, I see a calcium storehouse that gets robbed from or utilized through the early lactation period. And I, I give a, a good word here to Jesse Goff at Iowa State, who's really the guru behind so much of this for digging out these old studies and getting the rest of us onto them. These cows are amazing calcium athletes. The skeletal store of calcium is sufficient. We don't have that much trouble with it. They can be in negative calcium balance. The problem is these first several days after calving to get the mechanisms activated. And that's why our blood calcium concentrations get so disturbed for those first two days or so. So let's illustrate that. We'll use a study out of the Iowa State group, which Jesse Goff was involved with. We're gonna look at plasma calcium around calving. And some older Jersey cows, eight of them got milk fever and 19 of them did not. So here's days relative to calving. We're going to go from minus seven before calving to plus 14. Afterwards, we're going to show you their plasma calciums over here on the y-axis. Let's take those cows that got clinical milk fever first. They did the things that we would expect. They were just going along okay until two days before calving. One day before calving, they dropped significantly. Now, we don't know when that day is. It'd be nice if the cows would tell us, but they don't. Then they had very low calcium, typical of clinical milk fevers. They were all treated IV. They all responded, no problems, but they're still low on day one. We expect that because that's not a long-term fix. And by day two, they're coming up. They're still not there yet. By day three, four, then it bumps a little bit. They're really not straightened out totally until day six or seven on these old Jersey cows. These are the cows who did not get clinical milk fever in this study. And just to remind you, here's our general cut point for subclinical hypocalcemia. If we had to pick one, I'd pick 8.6. We're gonna show you there's lots of them, but we're gonna use that one as our reference point. These cows went below that one a day before calving. They were lower on the day up. They hit their nadir or low point one day afterwards, and then they really didn't get straightened out until about five days after calving. Most of the work was done in the first two days of restoring calcium homeostasis. But yeah, it's a shock to the system of these cows, no doubt. Another point I wanna make around this fragility notion of blood calcium, especially after calving, is there's not very much calcium in the blood. These are low concentrations. And I wanna to try to think of a way to illustrate that for you. So we'll come up with something here. Normal total blood calcium is about eight, six to 11. We Convert that over to parts per million, so it's 85 to 110, because that allows us to compare to other things. However, only half of that calcium is useful to the cow, actually ionized in solution. The other half is bound to protein. It really doesn't matter and wouldn't be a part of our comparison to other fluids. So let's think about 40 to 50 parts per million in the blood and compare it to drinking water. U.S. drinking water averages 51 parts per million calcium. There's more calcium in our drinking water than there is active calcium in the blood of a cow. If you buy mineral water, it pushes it up over 200. There's only two and a half to three grams of calcium dissolved in the bloodstream of a dairy cow. That's all there is. There's eight to 10 grams dissolved in all the fluid of her entire body. Maybe that would help you understand why it's hard to measure and why it's really important, even though it's not very much. That's lesson one, it's fragile. Lesson two, clinical milk fever, we don't wanna forget. The risk is low, but the outcomes are really bad. Just because those cows get up when we IV them, doesn't mean that everything is okay. On the good side, our incidence of clinical milk fever is declining, and we have very good evidence of that from the National Animal health monitoring system that we have in the U.S. These are random surveys of dairy herds. They do these on an infrequent basis, but they do update them. 6.2% clinical milk fever in 2002, down to 4.9. The last one was 3.7. As I work with herds, I say you got to be below 2% on your clinicals. I have many herds who do much, much better than that. 
down well below a half percent. We've done some really good things at reducing the risk for clinical milk fever in our dairy herds, and let's please keep it up. Okay, because it's bad when it happens. I've got a real busy slide here, but four different studies that look at the impact of clinical milk fever on subsequent performance of cows. Most of these are older studies when we had more of it. So you can see studies in the 80s with 4%, so that's even less than average. I like this 2010 Quebec study. And this 20, or 1984 study was a small one, but super powerful because this was a crossover where cows did or did not get clinical milk fever. So what does clinical milk fever do? Increases your risk for left displaced abomasum 3.4, 2.4x, just highlighting some. Herd removal is almost two times greater in cows with that. And we lost 14% of our milk in this very powerful study design so we can actually gauge what this does to cows, not just sit back and look at associations, but the cow is really being compared to herself in a crossover study to lose 14% of your milk for an entire lactation. I can't think of any other disease which affects cows production that much. So that's the clinical part. Lesson three is subclinical. Yeah, let's get started on that bad boy. And the risk is high for this one and the outcomes are bad but for the average cow, not for every cow. So let's dissect that one. First, how much do we have? One of the NOM studies, the Iowa State group went in and did some detail on that and pulled blood on a whole bunch of cows, 1,400 cows, 480 herds, said subclinical hypocalcemia was less than, or just excuse me, less than eight in this study, and they sampled them within the first 48 hours will show the risk for subclinical hypocalcemia by parity group. First lactation at 25% in this study. That, that kind of rocked us a little bit when we saw that number. And it's interesting, we've not been able to repeat that anywhere else. Um, the study that comes later, this German study shows 6%. So data I have from some field work is definitely in that 6% range, not up at 25. But that's what they got here. It is what happened, but notice the risk going up as we proceed through the age and the number of lactations, 41, 49 to 51%. The German study, which is a big study, also a lot of herds, same parameters around defining subclinical hypocalcemia. Risk goes up and up and up with parity. Just one of the strongest, most predictable things about hypocalcemia. Older cows give more milk. Older cows cannot mobilize calcium as readily from their skeleton. It's quiescent at that point, and we get a higher risk. I call your attention to how this would come out if we just looked at the second and greater lactation cows, which is how we do most of our milk fever stuff, 46%, 48% across that. I do that because I've done a survey of this. I'm not going to show you those data right now, though they are in your handout, getting 35% on a more recent U.S.-based study. Now, we're getting more milk out of our cows but our proportion of cows that are subclinically hypocalcemic has apparently gone down a bit. Uh, mine was more of a convenience than a rigorous uh, random sample like the NOM sample, but I do think that number probably has gone down some. There are also different cut points you can look at though, because there's not just one cut point that applies to this. Whenever you're doing this within herds, or amongst herds especially, your herd interpretation must account for the higher risk in older cows. If you don't adjust these numbers for the parity of your cows, you're gonna overestimate the problem in your older herds and underestimate the problem in your younger herds. So it really ought to be taken into account. We don't have a formal way to do that yet, but we absolutely should be getting that. Now I wanna start making the argument that subclinical hypocalcemia is bad for cows, even right around calving. I'm gonna start with this study that was done in 1982. It was a Wisconsin study looking at the stress associated with hypocalcemia. So we're gonna look at the stress hormone plasma cortisol by calcium status after calving. So this is right focused on calving. We're gonna take samples minus three up to two and a half days after calving. And here we're gonna show you plasma cortisols by calcium status. So this is the cows who had normal blood calcium throughout. They did not become subclinically hypocalcemic. So their cortisols went up. 
Well, there's no surprise there. I think calving is stressful. And it went back down by day one. This is the interesting one. These are the cows who were subclinically hypocalcemic below eight around the day of calving and their stress hormone went up. Cortisol went up significantly and quite a bit, not as much as the clinicals. There's a clinical milk fever. Wow, that's huge. And physiologists say that's a very, very high cortisol. Should be, you're just given birth and you were paralyzed. But this is persisting in both of these groups out. They, they didn't get this squared away until two days after calving. And even subclinical hypocalcemia is stressful for dairy cows. Okay, gonna take another look at this from a really interesting Florida study and how metritis status played with how calcium goes through this post-calving period. So we're gonna do days relative to calving, day of calving out to day 12, looking at their serum total calciums. So these are the cows who did not get metritis in this study. These are Holstein cows. These are more of the kind of numbers we like to see higher than those older Jersey cows. So they're starting in the upper eights. They hit their nadir, as we'd expect, around 8.8 eight on average. And then they move up again, very well straightened out, you know, pretty much there by day four, but still goes a little higher even on out. These are the cows who got metritis. And in the herd they used for this study, they had a lot of cows with metritis. I think it was around 25% of the cows were getting metritis. So what happened? They calved in the same. They actually didn't hit their nadir until day two, and they're already statistically different by day one. So lower calcium, lower calcium, it persists. When did they get metritis? Well, by definition, we say metritis starts, at least for us academic types, at day four. Why was calcium low back here? Well, we got two options. The low calcium caused the metritis because calcium is so integral to immune function. Totally plausible. The other possibility is they were working on this metritis, had inflammatory problems, and already had low calcium here, and it didn't express itself later clinically. Which one was it? Well, it is election year, so let's say both, because I think both are probably happening, and let's move on. Remember, here's your cut point, just to see that, and these cows really dipped over here, and these are the cows that got metritis. All right. That's subclinical and a little bit of what's going on there. Lesson four, we'll keep working on subclinical. It's really hard to figure out when to best look for it. When does it matter the most? And we're gonna give you two main options and two purposes for those. Day zero and day one, all the data I've shown you so far are in that window. That's the nadir, the low point. That's the easier one to get. And this one we can look at. However, some depression in blood calcium around this time is necessary if we're going to trigger that cow's homeostatic response and get her to mobilizing all that bone calcium. I wish they wouldn't go as low as they do. We'd love for them just to drop a little bit and figure it out. But a lot of cows don't. But we can use that time period as a way to monitor subclinical hypocalcemia. If we were to test them later days in milk, it would better predict which cows are in trouble. So a persistent or a delayed hypocalcemia is more detrimental than a hypocalcemia around calving, even if that initial hypocalcemia nadir was quite low. So two possibilities here. Which one do you use? And I'll go back to what my statistician friends would always say to me when we approach something like this. What question do you want to answer? Okay, I'll pose a question. Are my fresh cow or my pre-fresh cow diets doing their job? Are we doing the right thing in our nutrition in the pre-fresh period? If you want to answer that question, you test around the nadir, day one or day zero. If you test after that, so you tested day two, three, four, five, you are getting subclinical hypocalcemia that is secondary. And we're seeing secondary hypocalcemias to another disease. It's not your diets anymore. You don't want to be blamed for it if you're formulating those rations. Example of this comes out with a really neat study that just came out of Iowa State where you give LPS to cows. It's a lipopolysaccharide 
that, that's an inflammatory compound that comes from certain types of toxic infections. It induces hypocalcemia. It knocks these cows off feed. It does other things that messes up their blood calcium. If you give them oral calcium, it mitigates it. Great. Okay. It tells us that these things are happening and they can cause hypocalcemia. So if you're doing this, we're going to randomly sample these recently fresh cows. We're going to control for parity, either in the numbers or who we select. It's fine to send samples to the lab because your timing is not crucial. We really ought to evaluate multiple cut points and not argue about which one it is. Just do them all. But that would have to be a story for another day. This approach can work. And I'll add that subclinical hypocalcemia for the average cow is detrimental. I don't want people to say that a low blood calcium around calving means nothing, because that's not true. We have way too much data already in the bank that says that it is very detrimental to these cows, even if they're not clinical. And I'm going to run you through some of those studies. Elevated NEFAS and elevated liver fat post-calving for cows who are hypercalcemic or hypocalcemic right around calving. Two studies on that. Decreased rumination time. One study on that if they were subclinically hypocalcemic right around calving. And increased risk for a whole raft of diseases all based on it happening right around calving, day zero or day one. It is detrimental to the average cow. Now, other studies don't show negative effects, okay? That's true, we got two of those in the bank, and we know that that can happen. So we don't always see it, but we've seen it enough that we know for some cows, it is happening. All right, that's the first testing strategy. Let's come up with a second one. This one's new. Which cows have persistent or delayed subclinical hypocalcemia, the worst kind? And what are we going to do with that information? Well, the only thing I know to do with that information right now is to extend my oral calcium supplementation because they're still hypocalcemic. Something's wrong, and we have evidence that this, that this will help those cows. It's a whole different kind of testing. So we're going to test cows around two to four days post-calving. You could cherry pick out individual cows that you don't think look right. That's fine. You can test as needed. This is not really herd level. I don't get herd level inference off this in particular. We really ought to be doing this testing on farm because we're trying to do real time decision making. Unfortunately, we don't have a great uh, cow side calcium test unless we want to spend a whole lot of money uh, with certain types of testing equipment. But there's possibilities that this is going to get better and we're going to have some options out there. So I like throwing this one out. We have not proven it from a research standpoint that these cows definitely would do better, but it certainly makes sense that if we could identify them, then it would work. Now, many of these cows are going to have secondary subclinical hypocalcemia, but that's fine. We're just trying to make treatment decisions for these cows. So if we do do our testing a little later in that two to four day window, it is more consistently associated with negative outcomes. No doubt about that. So if we measure them later, it means more. It's worse to be hypocalcemic down the road. Some really nice studies on that. This persistent subclinical hypocalcemia affected future reproductive performance more than cows who are hypocalcemic on day one or two alone. This is the big Florida study I showed you with metritis, and they measured day one, two, or three. And if it was high somewhere in there, if it was low somewhere in there, it was associated with increased risk for metritis, neutrophil counts, it's your immune suppression being down, impaired neutrophil function, et cetera. The problem with this study and many other studies, because we didn't know this at the time that we did them, is they didn't separate out which day they were hypocalcemic. Was it zero, one, or two, or three? So we got some data which shows that mostly coming from one lovely data set out of New York. Um, so this is some of Jess McCart's group's work. And we got 396 Holstein cows and two herds that they sampled on days one, two, three, and four after calving. They didn't do a sample the day of calving, but that day of calving and day one are pretty close bedfellows. So what did this study tell us? It gave us an idea in a rigorous setup of when would be best to find the highest risk time 
for hypocalcemia being associated with diseases. And they found out that that was dependent on the parity of the group. So here's third or greater cows. We're going to lump together metritis and DA, which we often do in these kinds of studies. The best day in milk to test older cows to predict metritis or DA was day four. The cut point was pretty high, 8.8. So if they were below 8.8, that was a problem. That was 43% of the cows, and they were 3.1 times greater risk for metritis or DA. If they were below 8.8 .8 at day four. For second lactation cows, it was different. It was day two, it was a lower cut point, fewer cows, but higher risk. For first lactation animals, which do get a fair amount of metritis, it was day four. It was 8.6 is the cut point. It was a fourth of our heifers, but they were six times more likely to have trouble. So I think this illustrates some of what we're talking about as to how difficult it is to figure out when and how, but these later days in milk are clearly more predictive of disease. What about milk? So here's milk, weeks one to 15. We're gonna lump all the older cows together. And if we look at one day in milk, and use a really low cut point of 7.1. That was still almost a fourth of these cows, which is a bit alarming. I usually don't see that many cows that low um, on day one, but that's what they got in this study, and they gave more milk if they were lower. You bet they did. We have known this for decades that this happens. They did not give more milk because they were hypocalcemic, they were hypocalcemic because they gave more milk. Same group of cows, test them for calcium on day four. The cut point's 8.8, 39% are affected and they give less milk. So if they persist in that hypocalcemia or if it's new, then we're seeing less milk yield. And first lactation was very interesting. On day one, if they were below 8.6, which is 40 of them, they gave 11. Uh, 0.6 pounds more milk. A lot more milk if they would get a little bit hypocalcemic. These are dangerous data because we automatically, inherently, want to confuse association with causation. And I'll say it again, the low calcium did not cause any of these cows to give more milk. And if we could have figured out a way to prevent that, they would have given even more than what they did. Same data, and we're gonna slice and dice these data a little differently. So again, really nice work to help us learn about this, taking those cows. I'm just gonna show you the 263 multiparous cows out of this study, put them in four categories, normal calcemic all the way through. That means they were above 7.1. We saw that cut point before because they derived it from the previous studies. So they were, quote, okay on the first one, and they were okay on the second one. They had the least adverse health events, but they didn't give all that much milk, okay? Let's do the transient ones. So they were low initially, and then they were high on day four. They were okay on day four. The adverse events, these are the same. There was no difference between these. They were numerically higher. When you model it out, they were the same, but the milk was a lot higher. We expected that because cows that start low are just higher producing cows. They indeed were. And if they fix it on their own, that's great. The persistently subclinically hypocalcemic cows do not do particularly well. They start lower. They're probably higher producing cows inherently, but they stay low out here. They have more health events and they give a little less milk. This was significant. And these delayed SCH cows actually performed the worst. It's 27% of the cows in the study. And they started okay, which means they might not have inherently been the highest producing cows, but then they were low later on and they had the same number of adverse health events as the other cows, but the milk was the lowest on these. This is awesome physiology, but how do we apply it? And I think the testing scheme I just showed you is one way to apply it. Otherwise, in the absence of rapid, cheap, on-farm calcium tests, there's not much more we can do with this information right now. Okay, if I have scared you about the impact of clinical and the impact of subclinical, I have succeeded. 
and we need to be thinking about prevention. So we'll move on with that and a poll question. Very good, Gary. We'll give you a quick break here. Uh, get ready to vote. And this is going to be tricky. Uh, so Abby, get ready. What means of hypocalcemia prevention are you using or recommending? And you can pick one or more. That's the neat thing on this survey. So not all the above. You can't check that one. The first one is low calcium diets before calving. And we know uh, the University of Pennsylvania has championed that one. Uh, the calcium binder zeolite A before calving. That's a new product that's on the scheme right now. Number three. Uh, the use of anionic salts or products, the acetogenic diets before calving. So this is your DCAD uh, approach uh, for some of us. Number four is IV calcium uh, at or after calving. Uh, routinely, a blank. In other words, I'm just going to take an IV. And I know we had registered breeders in Illinois. They Every three-year-old cow got it. And then we have the oral calcium after calving. That's going to be your boluses. It could be a drench or something like that. And that's routine or blanket as well. And Dr. Etzel will probably discuss that as well. So the polls are open and we have 64% of the vote in. You've been voting for one minute. So uh, Jim, let's close it. We've used enough of Gary's valuable time. And Dr. Etzel, are you surprised? Um, I am just only mildly surprised. Uh, thank you all for, for voting on this one. Um, yeah, the low calcium diets are what we have to use in a lot of herds. The calcium binder at 8% is almost exactly where I thought it would be. Cytogenic diets coming in there well. We've got some IV calcium. And I think the oral calcium, and I'm hoping this is routine or blanket use at 55%, was probably a little higher than I expected, but there's good reason to be doing that. So thank you all very much. And it, it does confirm some thoughts and raise a couple new ideas. So now I'm going to go into questions that you all sent in ahead of time, because that just plays right into what we're doing. So we've got this situation, which is one of our options here, and 9% of our, our respondents are doing this, injecting calcium IV immediately after delivery and the next day, if, if you wish, will it interfere with calcium homeostasis compared to a calcium bolus? Yes, it will. And it will interfere badly with calcium homeostasis. And it's fun when you have a study that just nails the, the question directly. So this is Cedric Blanc's study uh, done in California a few years back. Um, this was a large Jersey herd. They, they pulled out some of the older cows, did three treatments, 11 cows per group. So very intensive sampling of these cows right around calving and then looking at their serum total calcium. So the first group we're gonna show you here is the control cows. Those 11 cows got nothing. They just went through the early lactation period on their own. You can see these are pretty low numbers coming in with averages just a little above seven. They're, they're Jersey cows, so they're very bright. They hit their nadir exactly at 24 hours and they were getting along actually quite well by 48 hours. The group average was up toward nine, which is really good. So that's just doing nothing at all for prevention in these cows. Here's oral calcium, here's two boluses, one at calving and one 12 hours later, directly on label for that. And this is the classic response that we've seen over and over again with oral calcium. It goes up, it goes up pretty modestly and around a half to one milligram per deciliter is what we get. It persists out, remember the last dose was given here, by about 12 to 24 hours after it's gone. Out here, it dropped a little bit. These were not significantly different and they're quite high and nice for Jersey cows. So the oral calcium gives this gentle support, but does not create what we call a rebound hypocalcemia. And that's what happens when you give IV calcium. So the third group got IV calcium right here. It was just one dose. It shoots way up. The first sample was taken an hour post administration. If they would have checked them earlier, it would go up to easily twice this. They go up into the mid 20s on this, very close to a toxic amount. That's why we kill cows when we give IV calcium, a fatal heart block induced by hypercalcemia. And then we shut down all their mechanisms to mobilize calcium. All the good things that were going stop. In fact, the body has so much regard for calcium. There's a hormone called calcitonin that protects against hypercalcemia. So we not only stop them, we throw them into reverse and the rebound hypocalcemia follows this pattern by 24 hours. They were significantly lower than if they gotten nothing at all 
and they stayed that way out to 48. So the principle here is simple. Do not give IV calcium ever to a standing cow because you're going to get a tremendous rebound on the backside of that. Only give it if she needs it. Oral calcium provides that support that we need through this critical time period. I say it provides the support that we need. It helps. Okay? It doesn't fix it because we can't fix it right now, but we did a very large prospective uh, randomized clinical trial, which are very expensive and hard to do. And we found that lame and higher producing cows, meaning higher previous lactation in milk production, responded best to the oral calcium supplementation. That was 48% of the cows in the study. The lame cows had fewer health events if they were given these two boluses around calving. And this whole group conglomerated together, gave 7.2% more milk at first test if given the boluses. So they gave more milk. Interesting, health events were numerically lower, but not different from the control cows. They were non-significant. So what happened, so we got more milk in early lactation, and we didn't compromise health, which is almost impossible biologically, but they did that with this calcium. Another interesting thing is with the oral calcium, the cows shunted it to milk, did not go about trying to fix their hypocalcemia. It just allowed them to keep doing what they want to do, which is just to give a whole bunch of milk and a whole bunch of calcium for their calves. Other things that came out of this study that were interesting, the highest risk for hypocalcemia, which we've shown you, older cows especially, does not equate to the best response for supplementation. There was no effect to parity at all within the study. We looked at how well they responded to the oral. Second, third, fourth, fifth, it didn't matter. There's not a rationale for picking out older cows to give them oral calcium. It doesn't work that way. In fact, whether they were hypocalcemic at all didn't affect their response. Because they're gonna shunt this to milk, okay? Twins, stillbirths, dystocia, did not interact with oral calcium supplementation, meaning that it didn't mean that those cows responded better. This is not intuitive. This is a complex response to oral calcium. And what we think is happening is, by and large, these cows are shunting it off to milk, making more milk, and just doing a little better in early lactation, but not fixing some of those other issues that go with having subclinical hypocalcemia. So let's go to our dietary means of prevention. And when we see folks are doing that, we got dietary calcium restriction, the binders, and our acidogenic or anionic diet. So here we go, because we don't want these down cows. So dietary calcium restriction, sometimes it's about the only thing we can do in, in low input situations. That this is gonna require very low calcium intake to work. We have to create a true calcium deficiency in order to activate these calcium homeostatic mechanisms. That means we have to be under 15 grams of elemental calcium per cow per day. That is nearly impossible without having very unusual feed ingredients. If you only get part way there and don't get deficient, you don't turn on the mechanisms and you don't get much help at all. Okay, the second one is the calcium binder. So we're going to go right to your questions again. Do you have any experience using calcium binders for preventing hypocalcemia and other disorders? How do they work? Is an anionic diet better? I'll do the experience part first. I'm a troubleshooter out in the field and an educator. That's what I do. I have one herd that I take students to on a pretty regular basis that switched over from a good anionic diet to using the calcium binder. And this was several years ago. How did it work? Yeah, it looks about the same before and after. The one thing that was clearly different was during the switchover, we got a boatload of clinical cases. So I would encourage you to be aware of that because there's a time period as you switch over that these cows are neither acidified nor has their calcium been bound up long enough and it kind of leaves them flopping in the breeze and you will see more clinicals. So is the anionic diet better? The short answer is, I think they're about the same. Very similar question. I love the international questions that come in. Um, 
you know, can you compare them? I'm not aware of any studies that directly one-to-one -one same cows compare these. Some of that may be in the works, but I'm gonna go back to, yeah, it looks like a similar kind of effect. So what's going on here with this dietary calcium binding? We're creating a functional calcium deficiency. It really does. And that part of it works. Use a compound called zeolite A, which is mostly sodium aluminosilicate. You may recognize these compounds as things we use to bind mycotoxins, but at a very large dose, about 500 grams per cow per day, we can bind up calcium and improve calcium metabolism, reducing the risk for hypocalcemia, roughly equivalent to acidogenic diets. Number of published studies, the big one coming out of Cornell recently. So yeah, it puts us in that ballpark for sure. Advantages on this approach, it's easier to manage than anionic salts, and it's accomplishable compared to the low calcium. You don't have to monitor urinary pH. You don't have to adjust the dose to what you're feeding. It's 500 grams and you stay with it. The disadvantages are many in our limiting adoption. So rather high cost, as we said, $1.25 per pre-fresh cow per day, roughly in, in our numbers here. This tends to push producers toward a shorter pre-fresh period to feed this very expensive stuff a shorter time. And I'm gonna remind you that this is potentially disastrous. And as you have cows that don't spend enough time in that pre-fresh pen, they're, they're gonna calve with low intakes, fatty livers, and you're gonna have a whole bunch of energy-related problems afterwards. Do not shorten that pre-fresh period. Those are battles that we, we fought in, in one a decade or two ago. Let's not go back. Okay, this is a non-specific binding. It binds other minerals. Is that harmful? We don't know. Probably not too bad. Um, but we have documented hypophosphatemia out of that Cornell study. I personally don't think that one's a problem. The cow places such low metabolic priority on phosphorus. I don't think this one matters. It just is a little unsettling. There might be other things. There are studies that show feeding this much aluminum to cows allows aluminum to accumulate in bone to the point of toxicity in dairy calves, but that's not in cows. I don't know that this plays out, probably not, but it's just a little unsettling. It's very likely going to interfere with our response to oral calcium supplementation post-calving. We don't know exactly how long it lasts, but if we want to come in with boluses on cows who are just coming off a binder, my expected um, response there would be none, that it's going to bind up that oral calcium and we're going to lose that management option on those cows. The other thing that I found interesting on a disadvantage of this is just the adoption has been really modest in Northern Europe, and that is where these things were developed. So I'll go off on a little side story. This was the first paper published on this topic. It was 2001. It came out of Denmark where the product was developed. Rolf Jorgensen was an acquaintance of mine. We talked about this in the late 90s. So we knew this was coming and he had shared some of his data with me. This was their very first study where it really did well at Jersey cows. They had some control cows who got clinical and subclinical or the, yeah. And then the, instead of control here, I should say, this should have been the zeolite cows and they had no cases of clinical or subclinical in those cows. So in a small introductory study, you bet it looked good. Now, I've been fortunate. I get to travel a bit, see the dairy industry in other parts of the world. I've been back to Denmark probably four times since this product was introduced there. So almost as soon as I get off the plane, I'm asking people, how are you doing? You know, this is home court advantage to this approach. Uh, what are you getting? And the adoption rate has been pretty low, hanging in that five or 10%. In fact, I was over there uh, May a year ago, spent a week bumping around with uh, Danish dairies and Danish dairy veterinarians. It was wonderful. And all the buzz was anionic salts and acidogenic diets. And yeah, th this was old news and wasn't anything particularly relevant to them. The herds that could make it work were doing it and the herds that weren't, and it was fine. So acidogenic diets is the one that's been around a little while, most commonly used as the poll revealed and the most practically effective one, I think, for what we have today. There are a plethora of published studies and meta-analyses on this subject. I've got two of those meta-analyses myself 
And hey, I even saw earlier that Edith Charbonneau is on this seminar. Edith was, was my main writer. I'm one of those. So shout out to her for a nice job on that. And we know these anionic salts work. Our tendency is to expect too much from them. And I think we just think that they're gonna turn off our clinicals and the data say it's about a 50% reduction in clinical milk fevers. How that plays out on herds is breakthroughs still occur. We still get cases popping up here and there and we can't overreact to that too much. We can't shut this down to zero. Another thing that's interesting and a little surprising, but we don't know very well how much these anionic diets or acidogenic diets affect the subclinical form. Because when we did most of this research, we weren't paying much attention to subclinical and certainly not in the detail. We now understand that we have to. So initially looking at those data, I think it's better at preventing clinicals than subclinicals. It's still highly important. We ought to be doing it. It's, it's practical, et cetera, but it is maybe not a uh, panacea for the subclinicals either. That's because cows just want to milk. Okay, if you're using the acidified diet, you still have to check urinary pH. Nothing has changed. The calculated DCAD is not accurate enough to optimize that dose. This takes a lot of management. That's why a lot of people don't want to do it, and that's fine. You've got to check your pH because there's inaccuracies in your mineral analyses and there's unexpected changes in forage mineral content. We've got an amazing biological test in urinary pH that we can optimize the dose of these anions. Some of the best money and time you could spend on a dairy is to monitor your urinary pH if you are using these diets. The goals, they shifted around just a little bit and I think that's unfortunate because we've made too much of it but the, the mean pH around 6.5 is where we ought to be. I'm more concerned about these ends of this and not tweaking the middle. These groups and these cows are over acidified if the mean urinary pH is below 5.5. That is suggestive of an uncompensated metabolic acidosis. When we do this, we're supposed to just have a compensated acidosis and not put them to a point where they feel sick and reduce dry matter intake. But if urinary pH is below 5.5, that is possible. If that's the case, you should reduce the dose of supplemental anions immediately. That's why we do this. And you are under acidified if you're much over seven. There you've just missed an opportunity. You're suboptimally preventing hypocalcemia and you can increase the dose of your supplemental anions. But management is important and is required to make these acidogenic diets work. So to summarize those five lessons, and hopefully this has been helpful for you, calcium homeostasis is fragile around calving because cows are amazing in what they put out. Clinical milk fever is low risk, but the outcomes are very bad. Subclinical, high risk, bad outcomes in general. When you look for subclinical hypocalcemia, if you do choose to test, and you don't have to, but if you choose, it depends on what question you want to answer, what the purpose of your testing is, and then keep going on prevention. It is crucial for all forms of hypocalcemia. So at this point, I will we'll turn it back over to our moderators, and we can also move into the question phase. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Etzel. Great presentation. You covered a lot of ground and offered some very practical advice for producers and consultants. So it's always a pleasure to have you on our webinars. I know it's been a few years and I always enjoy your presentation. So I'm glad that we were able to share you with our audience today. I also want to give a thank you to Technic. They are the sponsor for our webinar this month. And if you want to learn more about their company, you can go to the handout section of the GoToWebinar control, go to control panel. And along with the presentation slides, you can also print off some materials to tell you a little bit more about the Technics company. So please go ahead and check out that area for more information. If you'd like to view this webinar again, or any of our past webinars, you can find them all in our archive, which is available at the HORDS website um, www.hordes.com and then go to the pull down um, menu and check out our webinars. We've been doing these webinars together with the University of Illinois since 2011. So there's a lot of archived presentations available there. And um, as we were talking about earlier before the presentation began today, 
um, Dr. Etzel has spoke with us, but it's been a few years and his past presentation is one of our most viewed archived webinars. So if you want to learn a little bit more about um, some of his work and recommendations, go check that out on our website when you have time. I want to look ahead to our next few months. So if we can move the screen ahead, there you go. Um, our next webinar is October 12th, and the topic for that one will be using milk cultures to treat mastitis. And our presenter that Monday will be another veterinarian, Mike Zurkowski, and he works with the Cornell Quality Milk Production Services Laboratory. So he will be talking with us about how you can use those milk culture results to treat mastitis cases. The sponsor of that program will be Ozalea, um, and we appreciate their support of that webinar. Then looking at November, as we near the end of the year, which is kind of hard to believe, but in November, we'll have a feed and forage outlook. And the presenters for that webinar will be our very own Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois, and then Mike Rankin, who is our hay and forage grower managing editor. And the sponsor for that webinar will be Kuhn. So please, if you are interested in either one of these topics, mark your calendar and make plans to attend um, one or both of those presentations. Now, we already answered some of the questions that came in in advance, but we do have a few more. And then there also are quite a few questions that have come in during the presentation. Um, I will let everyone know that if you haven't already, you can type in your questions in the question section of GoToWebinar's control panel. And we'll get through as many as we can um, today, but I know we have quite a list here. So Mike, I'll let you start sorting through those and we'll have Dr. Etzel um, take his best shot at giving um, some answers to them. Well, Dr. Etzel, you're right. This will kind of be the speed round. I think got about 15 questions here, but the first one came in ahead of time, and that's always neat to send those ahead. That gives our our, our webinar person a chance to look look at these. The question comes from Sweden. It says, how long after calving can you expect a subclinical hypocalcemia to last? You may have answered that partially already. And is it fair to expect a cow with early ketosis to also have hypocalcemia? Dr. Etzel? All right, excellent questions. The how long it lasts, I think I showed you several data sets um, that, that say we're going to see it lasting out in that two to four or five day range. Certainly should be resolved by then. Hopefully we made a compelling case that it needs to be resolved by then. The, the next question is one I, I would love to have an answer to, and hopefully we will at some point. Is it fair to expect the cow with early ketosis to also have hypocalcemia? Uh, we really need to know that, but we need on-farm rapid calcium testing, I think, to get that answer in, in the big ways and the big studies that we need. Um, I, I think you're going to find a lot of hypocalcemic cows. Anything that puts them off feed and the factors that set them up for ketosis are similar to what we would expect from hypocalcemia. They're not all going to be hypocalcemic if they're ketotic, um, but I'm going to anticipate that a portion will. And using calcium in your oral treatment for those cows is entirely reasonable and a wise thing to do. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned cow side test, Dr. Etz. Are you aware of any cow side tests that farmers can do or veterinarians can do uh, on, on the spot? Yeah, we got a couple options, but we're, we're not quite there yet. There's the, the real expensive ones, the... Uh, the portable labs uh, that, that we have out there in the machine it, it's handheld but it's like seven eight thousand dollars per machine you put in a, a cassette and it runs that's about twenty dollars per cassette you get several lab results off of that so there, there's a couple of different companies that, that market those um, there was a meter that looks similar to our uh, urine pH meter. It's a soil pH meter where they put a calcium sensitive electrode on there. And a lot of work went into that one. And in the end, it just wasn't accurate enough for what we were interested in. It was pretty expensive, a couple thousand dollars to get started on that. And the, uh, the reagents to calibrate it were pretty expensive. But what, what got us there was just that really, really, really low concentration but it was ionized, which was sweet. Uh, the next generation of technology that's coming is going to be similar to the kind of tests that they're doing out in human medicine, um, where they're, they're little miniaturized dry chemistry procedures, and they, they can do some work with that. And so we're, we're looking at those. I, I think that there might be something there. I don't know. Calcium is a tough one to measure. 
And next Thank question you. has to do with uh, how, what percent of cows, uh, do you, if a herd is struggling with, hypo, with hypocalcemia, uh, what percent of the cows need to be hypocalcemic before you're concerned? Yes, um, depends on your threshold. And th this was uh, a part of my uh, original slide deck and I wound up taking them out, but it's a fairly complicated answer to that. And a, I almost feel like apologizing, we don't have it better developed right now, but it's gonna depend on which cut point, you probably should use multiple cut points and it's depend on which day you're testing what your purpose is. So I wish I could give you an, an easy answer on that one. And we, we'd probably have to sit down and show you some more slides and um, and see if we could talk through it uh, to get to that point. Okay, here's a, a bit of a case study. So listen carefully. It just came in and so it, it jumped our, in our series uh -oh. here. Um, we, are, uh, we are feeding 45 grams of calcium uh, as, as a low as a low diet plus anionic salt to get a pH around six to six five. Uh, when the, the dietary calcium intake is up to 125 grams, we seem to have problems. But when we go up to 225 grams, it's okay. Uh, what what's your interpretation of this? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I think you just proved that a bunch of meta analyses are right. Um, that well, first point. Um, before we run through this, the most important thing you're doing is the anionic salt. That's what's driving your hypocalcemia prevention. What you're doing with calcium is secondary and isn't terribly important. I know you may have you know, empirical things where things go up and down, but a lot of things get in there that we don't totally understand about that. So if we go back to the research, we see calcium does not have a lot to do with it once you get your anionic salts in. However, what we do see is that middle level appears to be the most harmful, but in a pretty small way. And that came out in the very first meta-analysis I did, been confirmed several times. So I think you're just confirming our, our science of staying out of the middle range, but being in the acidogenic range is what really matters for you. Okay, uh, another question, and we're gonna go faster now, believe it or not. What's the purpose of a calcium phosphorus ratio for dairy cows? Your thoughts. The purpose of a calcium phosphorus ratio for dairy cows to confuse people and uh, point to something that's not overly relevant. It's, we do look at those independently and we don't want our diets to be very high in phosphorus. So I do not look at calcium phosphorus ratio, but I don't want my phosphorus to be too high. Okay, what is better? A partially acidified DCAD, which is a pH of six to six five, or a fully acidified pH 5.5 .5 to 6.0? Um, the, the question is interesting because the terminology is incorrect. Um, you are fully acidified at a 6.0 to 6.5 in terms of the physiology that we want to create. The 5.5 and below is over acidified. It's not physiological. You're on your own. I have seen herds do that, run them extremely low, and it seems to work. And perhaps with really excellent management, you can do it. But what's better? 6.0 to 6.5, hands down. Do no harm. Okay, a uh, little longer question. Is the term negative decad the same as anionic salts? Uh, another related question, is there any side effects by having a negative decad on cow health? And we'll stop there. There's a third question. We'll catch that one right, 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 right next, okay? Yes, well, the terminology is, is difficult and sorry to have had to gloss over that a bit, but as we feed anionic salts, we are feeding, you know, a portion of our diet that's high in chloride and sulfur and low in sodium and potassium. So if we add those things up, that's our DCAD. We're trying to get that chloride and sulfur part high. We're trying to get the sodium potassium part low. So a low DCAD diet is a diet to which anionic salts have been added. And a low DCAD diet is an acidogenic diet because it evokes this acidogenic response in the cow, hopefully putting them into a compensated 
metabolic acidosis. And I already am missing the second one, Mike. Yes, I'm sorry. I won't do that again to you. Is there any side effects of a negative DCAD on other on cow health in general? Could be edema, yeah. it could be ketosis, it could be uh, any other the metabolic conditions. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So side effects on that. The main thing that we are concerned about, I'm not the side effect per se, but if we over acidify, we get into that uncompensated acidosis. They don't eat as much. And if they don't eat as much, we are going to be creating negative energy balance prior to calving, setting them up for all kinds of problems post-calving. We really, really want to avoid that. So we're working the energy and calcium part at the same time here, and, and we can't favor one and mess up the other one. So that's the main thing. We're within the physiological range unless we get those urinary pHs too low. These cows are fine. The, the way we manage modern cows and fertilize our fields, we've actually crept them toward a metabolic alkalosis over the decades, and we're just setting them back, if you will, and probably going a little more acidic than what they were. I don't think they ever had urine pHs below seven, but well, we really pushed them up um, with the kind of crops that we grow now because of all that high potassium in our fertilization. So that part's okay. The um, calves have a slightly lower blood pH as the cows do. And there've been some concerns on calf health and they've appeared to be quite minor, but I, I wouldn't want to say they are non-existent. But otherwise we're, we're fine on, on the cow health part of it. And the post-calving health is clearly better when we do this because they are less hypocalcemic they eat more, they get off to a better start. So we, we see improved intakes and um, probably improved disease outcomes on most things in general. Okay, uh, even shorter answers and political answers here. Is body condition more important than negative DCAD in, uh, in dry cows or close-up dry cows? Um, from a hypocalcemia standpoint, no, it's not more important. It is important. The heavier cows are at higher risk. Is it more important to the overall health of the cow? Because there are other diseases besides hypocalcemia. Boy, fat cows are very scary, high risk for ketosis, energy-related problems. Obviously, we, we want to do the best we can by both things. But we're, we're going to be very aggressive at trying to get your cows thinned down. Okay, uh, another political question for you is DCAD. The best preventative measure available to avoid calcium deficiency in transition cow, is that your number one recommendation when you visit farms? Well, it, I think we're going to have to look at the farm and see what we've got. And we're going to have to use all the tools we have. I think I laid out a case where for most farms, the anionic salts addition is going to be the most practical and reasonable way to go, but it's going to require some more management. I think other farms are going to go to the calcium binders. And I think that that is certainly reasonable in certain circumstances. And I think we're all going to use the oral where we can. I think we're going to get better at that with time, but we still know there are cows that benefit from that. And hopefully we're all going to stay away from IV as a prophylactic. Um, I, I will make one concession on IV. If that cow's so wobbly, she's about to fall over. You don't have to wait for her to go down before Dr. Etzel says you can give her the IV calcium. Yeah, you can give her the IV calcium while she's still up. But otherwise, the oral, it pops blood calciums very quickly. You get a lot into the bloodstream. Uh, don't do harm. Okay, here's one that you'll have to probably define it. It says, uh, what's the status of the research at the University of Wisconsin on 5-HTP to improve calcium metabolism? No idea what that is. Yeah, so 5-HTP, uh, we're into the, uh, the, the tryptophan metabolites. These are your serotonin-like compounds, just some amazing work that one of my colleagues, Dr. Laura Hernandez, has done over in dairy science, looking at a deeper level of calcium regulation and metabolism. Nothing has come to a point of commercialization yet with the things that, that she and others have worked on, but it's, it's amazing physiology they're working with. Okay, next question has to do, other, is there any relationship of other edema and, and calcium metabolism in dairy cattle? Does one relate to the other? 
Okay, very good. As far as a direct utter edema calcium link, I don't think so, especially because first lactation is so much higher risk for utter edema, and yet they're at lower risk for hypocalcemia. Anionic salts have a very mild diuretic effect, which is positive, meaning preventative toward utter edema. So if you switched over to anionic salts or you just been on salts and you suddenly have a problem with utter edema, you absolutely cannot blame the salts. They're even a bit preventative. Okay, another question. How much calcium, and I assume this will be with the DCAD uh, type diet, should I be feeding uh, before and after calving? Uh, any guidelines on how much, what are you recommending for dietary calcium levels? Sure, that, that's going to be a, a little bit like pinning jello to the wall, um, but why don't we, we give it a try? Uh, pre calving, stay out of that middle zone. And I, I think an earlier question that 100, 125 grams for us would be middle zone. Either go on the low side or go on the high side. I have a small personal preference to the low side. I think the data are slightly more convincing. The bigger picture there is that it doesn't matter that much. And we've already covered that. Um, Post-calving, we don't want to ignore this post-calving. And, and you saw the data, certainly the level of dietary calcium post-calving influences how long they stay in negative calcium balance. And we don't, we're not too worried about it, but we don't want them to be staying there too long. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be sitting with, with NRC uh, or other recommendations is likely being adequate, but do make sure those are available calcium sources. And I would not short my just fresh cows on calcium because they're so vulnerable to slipping back into hypocalcemia. Okay, we got five questions in five minutes, Dr. Etzel. So first of all, um, if if hypercalcemia is, is is related to inflammation, does it make sense to use cows with an NSAID, I assume that's aspirin or something like that, and yep. oral calcium? We are working on, on that. We, meaning the, the royal we, not myself personally, but we are, are moving closer toward linking some of these concepts. And, and I, I think it, it's fascinating. We're gonna need more information, but you know, what, what if we have inflammatory processes, leaky gut, whatever, driving some of these early hypocalcemias, they respond to oral calcium. Could they respond to these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? Uh, boy, it would be great if they did. So we're, we're learning more, but those are intriguing possibilities. Uh, another question from uh, Quebec has to do with calcium boluses with vitamin D. Uh, is that statistically useful in terms of calcium homeostasis in fresh cows? Um, I prefer vitamin D not be in any oral calcium supplementation at all because of the substantial risk for overdosing uh, because we know people tend to give more or perhaps more frequently than what the label says. If it's in there, I think it needs to be at a pretty low level. Um, vitamin D itself is very high in hypocalcemic cows. That's not their problem. Yeah, if we could come in with an active metabolite and just really take over her calcium metabolism, that would be one thing, but we've learned that's extremely dangerous because the toxicity just lurks so close to the therapeutic doses. And I think the same applies to oral. Um, I don't know that anyone's looked at the efficacy, but it would be difficult to even uh, get something like that passed an animal care and use committee because of the potential toxicity of vitamin D. A uh, question has to do with recommending as far as treatments of IV for calcium, uh, calcium uh, gluconate versus uh, CMPK. I assume that's a multi-mineralized uh, calcium solution. Comments on which one or ones you are recommending? Yes, um, we use straight 23% calcium gluconate. That's our U.S. product, 500 mLs IV. That's fine. There's nothing else in that bottle uh, besides some boric acid to stabilize it, and that is our preferred treatment for down hypocalcemic cows. Multiple electrolyte products do not make sense for these down cows on a number of levels. 
Um, the calcium is fine. It's got the same calcium in it. It has phosphorus. It's biologically unavailable. That doesn't even matter. It doesn't do any harm. doesn't do any good. The big harm is the glucose. There's a lot of glucose in that product. And these cows are already hyperglycemic. There's magnesium in there. These cows are hypermagnesemic. If they have clinical milk fever, why do you want to give them more? I don't know. Um, it just it doesn't make physiological sense. It probably does no harm. And there's a little bit of potassium, which actually might be the only closely beneficial thing is it may tamp down the cardiac toxicity just a bit, but it, it's not very much. So please just use straight calcium gluconate and do no harm. Okay. Uh, last two questions. The uh, first one has to do with rumination monitoring tools. Could that be useful to pick up the transition, transitional and persistent subclinical uh, uh, calcemic cows? Oh, I, I love this concept uh, of using the rumination. Um, it, it's not an area I've worked with, so I'm going to speak mostly from ignorance, but besides some enthusiasm for the, the topic just a reminder, though, that uh, rumination is, is, is definitely a very multiple factorial outcome here. I think one of the studies I showed you did show decreased rumination time with subclinically hypocalcemic cows, but other things could cause that. Uh, it's a useful piece to include in a decision-making paradigm. I like that part. The last question has to do with someone who's feeding a, uh, a, a low fertilized grass type diet and having no problems. Should he be checking or she be checking urine pHs, not using a DCAD, just using a, a basically a, a low potassium uh, feeding program? Uh, do not need to check urinary pHs. And I really thank you for that question. They're all good. But, but this one covers a point that didn't get covered before. And that was that you don't need to check urinary pH if you're not pretty actively acidifying. And in, in your case, you're not. You're moving the DCAD down, but not getting into a range where it's going to move urinary pH. You got to get close to a zero DCAD to start moving the dial on urinary pH. And um, you're just not there. Now, the difference is you lower DCAD, it does lower your risk of milk fever. If you lower calcium, it doesn't until you hit the deficiency point. Well, Dr. Etzel, we're going to stop the questions there. Uh, to be honest with you, we have more questions now than when we started, so they just keep coming in. Uh, Abby, let's turn it back to you to, to wind up to, uh, today's webinar and uh, go from there. Yes, we had great audience participation today, a lot of good questions. And Dr. Etzel, you did a tremendous job going through and providing thoughtful answers for so many of them. So we thank you kindly for that. Um, I wanna remind everyone that um, once again, that this webinar will be available on our archive. So if you wanna check it out, please go to our website and um, visit there and find it on, in the tab on our website. Um, also want to thank TechMix for sponsoring this program. We really do appreciate their financial support of our webinar program. Um, Dr. Etzel, we are very thankful that you took time to be with us today. I know that you're busy with your coursework on campus, so we appreciate you putting together a presentation for us to be part of our webinar series. And looking ahead, I want to remind everyone that our webinars, which take place on the second Monday of each month, in October, we'll be focusing on using milk culture results to treat mastitis. And then in November, we'll have a feed and forage outlook um, summarizing the crop year from 2020 and then looking at feed inventories for the coming year. So please make plans to attend one of those webinars if you are interested. And then last but certainly not least, I want to thank everyone who is out in the audience for joining us today and participating. We're really thankful that you choose to join our webinars and um, gain some information that we hope is really valuable for either your dairy farm or the dairy farmers that you work with. So once again, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Until our next webinar, I'd like to wish you all well and um, thank you for your time. Um, from all of us here at Hordes Dairymen and the University of Illinois, please take care and we hope to see you again.